corporate fraud works best in the shadows, behind corporate walls. How does the government bring these wrongdoers to justice? Whistleblowers. These are the stories of those who risk their careers to shine a light on allegations of fraud. Today on Fraud in America. On today's episode of Fraud in America, we are heading up to Boston, Massachusetts to visit with longtime Keytam attorney Tom Green. Tom Green is an attorney who set the path for off label marketing almost 30 years ago and recently brought home the most money ever recovered in a non intervene Keytam action. We'll do all that on today's episode of Fraud in America. I'm glad that we're sitting down today. So I, I went back and looked over, you know, the people that we've talked to over time, um, you know, Senator Grassley and John Phillips and Joyce Branda, you know, the people that really are kind of the, uh, the trailblazers for our bar and, mm -hmm. and our legal world. You are absolutely there, right? You're, you're the, on the Mount Rushmore. You're the, the Roger Federer of, of our bar, right? So I really appreciate you yeah. taking time. Tom. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about over your 30-plus right. years in this bar. Um, but I want to go back. Um, sure. Where were you raised? Where did it start? And why did you become a lawyer? I was raised here in Massachusetts, a small town, Westboro, Massachusetts. I was a political science major in college mm -hmm. um, and took constitutional law, the judicial process, the legislative process, and uh, introduction to business law. And I took those courses because I'm pretty sure I wanted to go to law yeah. school. At Boston and, College. Uh, yeah, yep. I went to BC yep. undergrad. Yep. 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 And uh, what I was interested in um, was courtroom work, trial work. Mm. And when I, when I went to law school, you know, you take all the courses, mandatory courses, uh, but constitutional law interested me again, and uh, so I took, you know, federal courts, and I think it was common law too, um, and of course on the First Amendment, and then uh, upon graduation, um, the only place I applied for a job was the uh, district attorney's office because I thought I'd get in the courtroom quickly. Yeah, here in Boston. Uh, no, it was. Uh, it's in Barnstable County, so we covered Barnstable, Duke, uh, and Nantucket counties, Cape Cod and the islands. Okay, and yeah. uh, I, I worked there my second summer uh, after law school, and they, that third year I did a clinic, and I was able to get down to, uh, second semester, down to the DA's office. Mm. In some of the cases that I had tried that summer in the district court, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a student, there were appeals to a 12-man jury trial in Superior Court in the misdemeanor session. Yeah. So two of my convictions were appealed, and the DA let me come down and, oh, wow. and uh, try those cases, 12-man jury trials, each one of them. So this is my third year, uh, second semester. As a third-year law student. As a third-year wow. law student. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, under the rules, you do it under the supervision of the, the DA, which mm -hmm. means an assistant district attorney. and. Uh, my, my first of the two trials, there was an assistant DA sitting next to me, and uh, you know they just sit there. You make the opening and, and the closing, and put, put the witnesses on in between. The second trial I did, which might have been a month later, um, no, no assistant DA showed up, oh. and the judge said, we've got to get this going. And so I, I got convictions in both, in both yeah, trials. Yeah. but. Uh, so that was kind of my, my interest, and I spent two years in the DA's office, and then I opened my own office in Boston. And wow, after two years at the DA's, you yeah. immediately oh, yeah, on I, the shingle. Yeah, yeah I came, came to Boston and opened yeah. my own office, and that was in December of 1979. Yeah. And again, doing just trial work, representing plaintiffs. Okay. Um, and most of my practice were injury cases, although we did do some commercial cases uh, representing plaintiffs. And that's how the practice started and, and developed. And I, I did my first False Claim Act case, I think it was in 1993. Wow. And uh, 
I'm trying to remember how I stumbled across it because I'd never heard of it yeah. until then. That was the Ferguson case, mm. uh, which had to do with the sale of a, a satellite communication system to mm. the Army uh, right. to be used in uh, desert operations. Mm. And the relator in that case was a, a graduate of West Point who worked for this company as an engineer. Mm. And the um, the system wasn't meeting specs, mm -hmm. and one spec was that it, it operate in high heat, and they were getting reports it's back in the desert. Yeah, yeah, from yeah. The, from the desert that it yeah. wasn't, and they were putting chunks of ice uh, on the equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and he kept writing them up, and they they fired him. They literally had guards escort them out. Uh, he, he had. Uh, saved a lot of the documents. And so that was my first False Claim Act case. Um, and I remember at Maine Justice, uh, I, think, I think it was, it was Dennis Phillips mm -hmm. uh, who, at DOJ who, who, who worked on that case. Mm. And it ended up in a favorable resolution when there was a cash payment and a recall and re-warranty, recall, repair, re-warranty of the equipment. Mm and my client had a wrongful termination claim that was successfully resolved. So that was my introduction to yeah. uh, the False Claims Act. So at, at this time, you know, the False Claims Act isn't well known, right? You're one of the early people to, to file under the, the modern False Claims Act. How did that come to your attention? Do you remember how you thought of, you know, this is a good application of this False Claims Act? I read an article, and I'm trying to date it, but I, I believe it was in Trial Magazine, so that was ATLA, okay, and yeah. I think that's where I read about it. Um, and I, I had never heard about it, and that caused me to do a little research. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at some point, well, my, my next case was Franklin, yes. fi filed in 1996. So sometime between 93 and, and 96, and maybe it was a bit after that, that whenever this article was, mm -hmm. it, it, it brought me to John Phillips. And I had a couple right. ca calls with John Phillips about off-label promotion and whether it was reimbursable, mm -hmm. uh, because my reading of the, the statute yeah. was it was not. And, uh, uh, but I, I didn't disclose you know, mm -hmm. who the defendant was or anything. Yeah. And, uh, but John was helpful. Um, and was interested in, in the theory. Mm. So somewhere between either just prior to Ferguson or right, right around 96, I came across yeah. that article. Uh, but you are right, there wasn't much out there yeah. about the False Claims Act. So Franklin was filed in August of 1996. So let's, yeah. let's talk about Franklin. Um, in, in preparing for this, I went back and read a lot of the, the opinions that came out of that case. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, you know, this case was filed in 1996, David Franklin. Uh, was working at Warner Lambert at the time. He was a, a medical liaison, yes, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, he was he fired? Is that how yeah. he came? A lot of them start this way, right? Yeah. Someone's fired and they call you. He had yeah. a PhD and he was yeah. interested in medicine. Um, and you are right, he, 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 um, he was employed as a medical liaison. And he only lasted there about four months. Mm -hmm. But as he said to me, medical liaison was really just a glorified sales yes. rep. Yes. Uh, it happens in, in these cases. We may be experts uh, in certain fields as attorneys, but the relators are experts in the field they work. Absolutely. And so he had to educate me about uh, pharmaceutical marketing and what was permissible and not permissible, and off-label marketing and off-label use. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so he did all that, and he had some really compelling documents. August of 1996, we filed that. So if we go back, um, you know, at the time, this application of the False Claims Act to reach off-label marketing uh, was a novel theory of liability at the time. Um, what made you think this could be used in that way? You know, there were like, those cases weren't there. You were the first to file those cases. Well, if you, if you read the statute, it, it, it basically said, I'm paraphrasing now, but Medicare and Medicaid would pay for uh, covered, um, covered drugs. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and they were defined as uh, drugs that are prescribed for an FDA use or drugs that are supported by the uh, statutory, uh, statutory compendia. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was only, there was a, there was a single one, um, comp compendium. And mm -hmm. uh, 
then a couple others were added, and I kept reading it and reading it, and, yeah. and it said, and off-label marketing was, is not permitted by the FDA. It wasn't then, mm -hmm. is not now, and uh, so I, I ended up calling, I had multiple conversations with people from CMS, yeah. um, and one woman there was very helpful, and I kept reading her the language, and I said, you know, mm -hmm. this is the way I'm interpreting it, but there's no case law, and she said, well, that's the way we read it, too, and there was an attorney um, at, at CMS, um, and they're careful, obviously, of what, what they can mm -hmm. say, but there was, uh, there was one attorney there I talked to initially a number of times, and who was pretty helpful. I, I just wanted to see, am I misreading this? Is there some yeah. law somewhere that I can't find? And uh, so we went with it, that off-label promotion is improper, it's yeah. against FDA uh, regulations, and uh, CMS won't pay for uh, drugs that are prescribed for an off-label use. Mm -hmm. They pay for covered out, I think it's covered outpatient, no, not outpatient, I think it's just covered drugs, I think mm -hmm. is the, the language in the statute. I have to go back and look at it, it's been some time. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that seemed like a viable theory, that they are, They've got this scheme where they're marketing to doctors nationwide uh, and trying to grow um, these off-label uses for a drug that was uh, approved initially. It was approved by the FDA as adjunctive therapy for seizures mm -hmm. at 1,800 milligrams and only for adults, not for children. Mm -hmm. And so they were engaged in a campaign marketing it for doses greater than 1,800 milligrams, which was off-label. Yeah marketing it for children, which was not in the patient class that the FDA had approved, that would be off-label, and then marketing it for migraine, neuropathic pain, restless leg syndrome, mm. uh, nociceptive pain, uh, none of which had been uh, approved by the FDA. Uh, what's more is for a couple of these indications, they had conducted a clinical trial and they had some positive results. But they also had negative results. And in the marketing, mm. they never disclosed the negative results. They, they touted the, uh, the positive clinical trial or the positive case report, but didn't mention the negative case report. Uh, so it was clearly um, you know, mis a misleading marketing, a fraudulent marketing, but the off-label marketing, that's what the basis of, of the false claim was yeah. because it was not reimbursable uh, uh, under the statute. Uh, the the off-label indications weren't. Mm -hmm. uh, and under the, the False Claims Act, it's the, the marketing caused to be presented a false claim to the government and the, the false claim being this claim for a, a, an off-label use, use that wasn't approved by the government. Yeah, so um, as you know, you know, when a physician writes a prescription, he doesn't put on the prescription what, what the indication is. He yeah. just writes the script for Neurontin. Um, but the company had a lot of internal documents that showed about pie, pie charts that showed different percentages, uh, uh, different indications that the drug was being used for, um, unapproved indi indications. And they, David Franklin, um, uh, experience that he, he was being instructed to to market it and to push for these unapproved indications so we we had a we had some good documentation to start start off with but then when we get into discovery and they had to produce all, all of the documents and back in those days you know the, it was just banker boxes and uh, uh, and you were going through them serially uh, OCR was uh, really not that reliable, um, but you could pick up a box, a, ba a banker's box of documents, and it was almost every page was a document that ev evidenced uh, the strategy of off-label marketing mm -hmm. and different tactics um, that they employed to promote the off-label uses. So it was a treasure trove. Uh, yeah of documents. Um, and there was a whole battle in that case uh, over the protective order uh, and, and trying to agree to terms on that before they would produce the documents. Mm. 
these were powerful drugs, epilepsy drugs, and to market for pediatric use and dosages that weren't approved. Well, what bothered David the most about what he was doing, I being think, asked to do? Yeah. Uh, the lack of uh, clinical evidence that would support yeah. uh, these off-level indications. He just didn't think um, it was proper. And I, I do recall when he's initially hired, they had a sales training. Uh, they brought everybody out. I, th I think it was to Chicago. And all the reps and medical liaisons were in one room. Mm -hmm. And he said that um, the, there were people from compliance and uh, attorneys up conducting the education. And at one session, they had a, a, a picture of um, commissioner, um, FDA commissioner uh, David Kessler. Mm. And they, they had it up, um, I think it was on a, a PowerPoint slide, and they were uh, making uh, critical remarks about him. Wow. And uh, uh, so the, the, the point was that he was instructed by compliance and, and, and by these attorneys not to put anything in writing. Be careful of uh, what you put down. And, and they had a slide up that, uh, like of a notepad that said, at the top of it, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, just to illustrate that if you wrote something that was incriminating, uh, that someday, someday it might become an, an exhibit at trial, which it, it did in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, David did testify um, in, a, in an Iran-related uh, case um, in U.S. District Court here in Boston in a RICO trial we had against Pfizer mm -hmm. over false and misleading marketing of uh, of Neurotin. Now, that was follow-on litigation mm -hmm. after the FCA uh, case resolved. Yeah. So the government looked at the evidence. You had a relator's meeting. David came in and talked about you know everything. And then in 1999, the government declined. Um, what was the thought process at that time about whether to go forward, and, and why did you decide to go forward with the case? So, uh, as I recall, it was Judge Saris was the, uh, the judge in, in, in the Franklin case, and she had granted many uh, extensions of the seal. And yeah. in, in December of 1999, the government wanted another extension, and she said, no, that's it. Ah. And they said, uh, well, we're not, we're not going to intervene. I forget now what they said. We're not going to intervene at this time. And so we, we took up the prosecution of the case, and that's when um, discovery really started. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would have been December 99, January 2000. And I think the court limited us to 15 depositions. So we went around the country, took depositions, and we had uh, a group of experts. We survived the initial motion to dismiss. Um, then, then discovery got underway. And then there was, a, um, there was a motion for summary judgment. Um, I, I think it was, I think it was in, uh, I think the decision came down in August of 2003, as I'm recalling. Uh, and as I say, we survived, we got a favorable decision on the motion to dismiss, but then the court went even further mm -hmm. uh, in the motion for summary judgment, holding that the, the, the marketing the off-label marketing that's causing um, prescriptions to be written and the government programs to pay for it for these off-label indications, that that's false. That results in a false claim. Yeah. Okay, so you didn't, you didn't have to prove, there was not a double falsity. You yes. didn't have to prove a false statement or record yes. to get uh, the false claim. Um, and, and Pfizer was making that argument, as I recall, that but that, that's the, the section, second section, you know, using a, a false statement or a false record to get a, a false claim paid. The, the, the first section is causing, uh, presenting or causing to be presented a false claim, and the court found the false claim here was the off-label, you know, mm -hmm. reimbursement for an off-label indication. So Judge Saris's 2003 opinion has been cited many, many times by yeah subsequent cases, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, if we go back for one second, so the government in 1999 said, we're not intervening at this time, or you know, we need more time, not giving us more yeah. time. Do you feel like if Judge Saris had kept granting extensions, they, they would have eventually intervened, or do you 
don't have a sense of where they were on that. I, I'm not sure. There, there was a grand jury that was convened in the case, yeah. um, and David testified before the grand jury. Um, so there was the, the, the criminal side was conducting that. Um, and of course, that's walled off, so mm -hmm. uh, we don't know much about that. But the assistant U.S. attorney I was dealing with in Boston, um, I, I don't know whether uh, they didn't have the, the 50 or however many there were, 50 or 75 boxes of documents. They didn't have that, that evidence. Yes. Uh, and, and of course, as you know, the, the, uh, the government will share sometimes some of what they've learned in an investigation, but they just don't turn over their file to you. Um, mm -hmm. Unless, of course, uh, the defendant serves a subpoena on them once the case is going forward and, and asks for the file. Mm -hmm. uh, and the court orders it, then, then we get it, mm -hmm. which happened in Biogen. I'm getting ahead of myself, <laughs> but in Franklin, no. So I, I don't have a sense of, of whether they would have ultimately intervened in the case. Yeah. Uh, when we conducted discovery, I regularly sent them um, updates, memos, and uh, I, I, I think I probably labeled them supplemental disclosures. Uh, mm -hmm. In, in memos summarizing depositions and key documents and producing them uh, to the government um, all along the way. But there was never, uh, never a call to say, gee, this is, this is pretty interesting. We'd like to intervene. Right. Um, they, they did have the criminal investigation underway. And, and ultimately, in the case, Warner Lambert who had purchased Park Davis and mm -hmm. Pfizer purchased Warner Lambert, but Warner Lambert pled to uh, uh, an information. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the facts that were set forth in the information were the facts that we uh, discovered during the course of discovery and provided to the government. So the first False Claims Act settlement I ever summarized and read was actually this case. Oh, was it? <laughs> in May of 2023, when this, yeah. uh, or May of 2004, when this case was announced. Uh, I went back and looked. That was the very first right? settlement yeah. I've ever read, so it's kind of interesting, full circle. Yeah. But $430 million, civil and criminal. Right? Sim yep, civil yeah. and criminal. Yeah. Uh, there's, there was actually some additional monies paid to the state. Um, the state AGs, uh, consumer protection divisions, as I recall, a group of them had gotten together, uh, and there was small number that's not included in that 430 uh, and I think it might have been 10 or 20 million that yeah. were, were paid to state AGs uh, for, for educational um, efforts uh, but yeah it was it was a long battle and, um, mm -hmm. and it sort of set the course I guess for some other successful cases well, it, to it, come it, along and I wish I wish I had some dividends, uh, you know. Well, I, I, I yeah. think we all owe you, including me, yeah. uh, a percent of every off label yeah. marketing case that settled after that. By the way, I added it up this morning, almost 14 billion. 14 billion. 14 billion yeah. in off label marketing yeah. settlements yeah. since this case settled in May of 2004. Uh, I printed them out, and yours yeah. is the very first one. Uh -huh. So then the train leads yeah. <laughs> many, many <laughs> right. cases after that. Um, what is your thought about that? the legacy of this case and all the cases and the industry that's changed. I mean, the, the blatant off-label marketing that happened in the 1990s, you don't, you don't hear about that anymore, right? It, it, it's uh, not as prevalent. Yeah. Um, we occasionally come across some of it, um, but it's, it's not as prevalent. And I, I, I think, um, as you say, all these cases that totaled $14 billion sent a message to the industry. Yeah. Um, and I think that's good. Uh, this, is a, this was a bad practice, you know, off-label marketing. I mean, it's what we have the FDA for, yeah. you know, to right. determine whether, you know, go through the process, file an NDA, uh, have the FDA evaluate your evidence, see if the drug is safe and effective. That's what the FDA is there for. And when you have the companies trying to do an end run around that mm -hmm. and, and market for these off-label uses, that ha safety hasn't been established, efficacy hasn't been established, and people can get harmed. Um, I mean, there was no evidence to be marketing Neurontin uh, as being safe and effective at doses over 1,800, uh, or for a pediatric population. Uh, 
So I, I think a lot of good has been accomplished, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think the industry has changed with regard to um, off-label promotion. They, they're, they're much more careful about it, as they should be. Yeah, I think, you know, the dollars are, uh, you know, if you write out $14 billion, there's a lot of zeros there. Yeah. But the lives saved. Without a doubt, you know, some of these drugs were used for pediatric populations, and not necessarily this case, but subsequent cases. Yeah. You know, those, what would have happened but for yeah. off-label marketing yeah. cases? Um, try not to think about it, right? The impact mm -hmm. of these cases yeah. really is remarkable. So, it, it, But it didn't end there. You then had a RICO case, right, involving Neurotin. Can you, could you talk about that? So, um, yeah, I think, I think it settled in 2004, and then I was approached uh, very soon after, uh, within a couple months, as I recall, uh, and, and I got involved in representing, well, there were, were there two classes, two proposed classes, uh, consumers and uh, third-party uh, health, health insurers. Uh, and, and again, uh, it was the false and misleading marketing yeah. uh, of the drug Neurontin uh, that, that caused uh, claims to be presented that were reimbursed by these commercial insurance companies, so no, no longer health care programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we proceeded under a RICO statute, which is a trouble damage statute, and the predicate acts were, you know, mail or wire fraud. So if you use, you know, the mail or wire and you make uh, misleading and, and false misrepresentations, there can be liability. Uh, and so. I chaired the steering committee uh, in that litigation, and we were before Judge Saris, and Judge Saris wanted a bellwether trial, and she selected uh, Kaiser Health. And so I and uh, a couple other l lawyers uh, tried that case, and I, I think it was a, about a five-week trial. Um, there was no offer in that case. And uh, we had great experts, mm -hmm. a great team of experts. The, the court even remarked about that. Uh, and the jury came back with a $47 million verdict. And Single. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and then it was troubled yeah. to, to about $142 okay. million. Yeah. And Pfizer appealed that uh, to the First Circuit. And about that same time, we, we had moved for uh, class certification, not once, not twice, but three times. <laughs> Uh, each time it was denied, and so we appe appealed that, and so the, the Kaiser verdict was up at the First Circuit, and the, the uh, denial of class certification was up, and heard by the same pa panel. And Justice Souter uh, had retired, but he was sitting on yeah. that panel. Um, and the First Circuit uh, re reversed the district court, um, and sent the case back down. And the verdict, uh, the First Circuit upheld it. Uh, Pfizer, of course, uh, uh, filed for cert with the Supreme Court on both cases, which the Supreme Court uh, denied. And with regard to the class, we were back in front of Judge Saris. At some point, Judge Saris made the remark, uh, Mr. Green, uh, uh, you and I are going to grow old together <laughs> <laughs> because the the Franklin case was about eight years, and then this case went on for, um, I think it was from 2004 to 2014. So it's it was 18 years. So it was almost yeah. 18 years. <laughs> wow. We were before Judge Saris uh, with, with Neurontin, but she was, she was a terrific judge. Um, uh, and the, I can remember the defense attorneys at, at the first hearing we had when we came back from the First Circuit, started to make the argument uh, against class certification. <laughs> and the court said, no, no, no. Uh, don't you understand? <laughs> you know, you lost. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we had a couple of mediation sessions after that, and we were able to settle the class case uh, for $325 million. So well, Why do you think there's not more companion civil RICO cases after these big pharma cases are settling on the key TAM site? I think there was another case involving Neurontin, another sh shareholder case that was mm -hmm. brought, as I, as I recall. Um, and I think the theory on that one was that Pfizer knew um, 
all this off-label marketing had gone on, not just for Neurontin, but for other drugs. Yeah. And uh, so I, I know of that case. I, I don't know with, with regard to these other cases. Um, I don't know what the evidence was like in, in those cases. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of them, I, I believe, the government intervened and settled um, of these uh, these cases that total 14 billion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we were able to get discovery in the case. Uh, that's because we conducted the discovery. But yeah. when the government's investigating, and if they settle it, um, they're not going to be disseminating the documents typically. You know, mm -hmm. there's a press release that's issued. Uh, in, in our case, you know, the evidence got out. There was a lot of press written about the Franklin case mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, a lot of the documents were in the open and filed uh, in court, you know, attached to different pleadings. There's a lot of incriminating evidence. Mm -hmm. in, in the class case, you know, we served, we, we had the benefit of the, the knowledge from the Franklin case. Uh, right. mm -hmm. But we went and did more discovery of the, uh, the marketing agencies mm -hmm. um, that worked for Pfizer and we subpoenaed documents from them, and we took depositions uh, from some of these companies. Uh, and you'd see a representative of a marketing company sitting on a committee with uh, Pfizer employees mm -hmm. and discussing marketing strategies, and there would be um, uh, minutes of these meetings. So there's, there's just a wealth of, of documentation. And in, in the class case, um, Pfizer's counsel tried to keep this uh, information confidential, uh, stamped every document confidential, even though they really didn't qualify yeah. for trade secret or other documents that are entitled to protection. They were just stale commercial documents. And uh, I wanted to disseminate them. Uh, and we had a hearing about this. And I said to Judge Saris that, um, I thought the public had a right to know that this was an interest, this was an issue that uh, uh, there should be public interest in. And she agreed with me. And as part of this uh, fight over the documents, there was a motion for intervention filed by the, I'll call them the media, but it was, as I recall, the Wall Street Journal, I think the New York Times. Uh, I think, I believe the Boston Globe, and one, one of the uh, major networks. Uh, and we, we had a hearing. They were, they were all represented by the same firm. And what the, to cut to the chase, the, the court ordered Pfizer to uh, redesignate the documents. Um, and she said, if you stamp something confidential, it better be confidential. Yeah. And then she turned to me and said, you know, uh, if you want to challenge something because you think it and can demonstrate to me it's not confidential, uh, then uh, attorney's fees under Rule 11 uh, hmm. would, would be applicable. Wow. So there, there were 50 or more boxes, and she ordered uh, Pfizer to redesignate them within two weeks. Uh, so there were millions yes. and millions of pages of, of, of documents, and, uh, and we got a new set of, uh, of documents, and mm -hmm. as I sit here today, I don't recall any of them being stamped confidential. <laughs> <laughs> so this time is interesting. I'm, I'm trying to keep the dates straight. So all the way up to 2018, now you're still in Neurotin back from 96 to 2018, but in 2012 you received a phone call about a local pharmaceutical company. So um, the, the call I received was uh, from an employee at Biogen, and uh, he, he was concerned about conduct there, and he had made complaints internally to compliance to try to get them um, to stop the practice, and the practice, of course, was paying kickbacks in, in the form of uh, consultant meeting payments or speaker bureau payments. So payments to physicians to serve as consultants or to serve in the company's uh, speaker bureau. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
he was uncertain that he wanted uh, to file a, a false claim act case, mm -hmm. but he wanted the practice to stop, and the company wasn't stopping it. So he wanted to disclose the the the, the conduct to the government. So it took some time, yeah. um, but eventually he came around to uh, agreeing to fa file a case. Mm -hmm. So we filed the Franklin case. I think it was in 2012. Um, I don't know if you've done the, the oh, if, you, if, you, if you've mm -hmm. looked at it, but yep, I think yep. it was mm -hmm. filed in 2012. Yep, yep. And, uh, and we had a couple of meetings with the government, yep. um, both locally and in, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, D.C. Um, and he had very good evidence uh, about marketing tactics mm -hmm. that were designed. They were they were uh, retaining hundreds of doctors as consultants mm -hmm. to right. get the advice that they didn't need. They already had on, on the same topic. Yeah. So they would go around to many cities across the country and make presentations the same agenda. And they tried to justify it by saying they needed to um, learn whether there were regional differences, you know, from differences from South Chicago to North Chicago. <laughs> right. They really did that. They, they well, held it two different There's cities. miles apart yeah. there, yes, yes. Um, and they had, a, they had a protocol they filed, uh, followed within the company, um, and they had, they had to fill out a, a, a request for called a needs assessment, that they really needed this advice. Uh, and of course, the whole thing was just a charade, but they would yes. go to compliance. Now, compliance would write comments on these forms saying, do you really need these number of meetings? Do you really need these mm -hmm. number of consultants? Do you really need these number of uh, speakers? Mm -hmm. But th those co comments were ignored because commercial controlled um, Controlled compliance. Compliance mm -hmm. was under commercial. They were a compliant yeah. department, not a compliance. Yes, they department. were. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was uh, it's what I called, we called compliance theater. Yes. They, they had a lot of things set up, but there was no teeth for the enforcement of it. Mm -hmm. And commercial could do whatever they wanted. And they did do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you know, once we survived a motion to dismiss, the, the, the government declined mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. investigating for, for a number of years. Yeah. And uh, I think it was declined in 2015. And then we got, we faced a couple motions to dismiss, survived them both, got a very good opinion from Judge Talwani uh, uh, on the motion to dismiss. Uh, and re re regarding Causation and, and proving the what the, the proving intent and whether we had to prove um, what what the 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 purpose of of the payment was. Did we have to prove but for causation? Yes. And uh, and and she found we didn't. That if 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 a single purpose, if just one purpose. Uh, was to influence prescription writing, then it could be a violation of the anti-kickback statute. And then during the course of discovery, we got reams of documents and good documents and a lot more than David had. Mm -hmm. And we uh, developed a team of experts. I, I think we had seven different experts from across the country, all top notch from different disciplines. Um, and so we had great expert reports. Biogen had five experts, and I've said it before, um, I think we really had the better team of experts, but mm -hmm. we were preparing the case uh, for trial. I, I think the, they were trying to hold us to 15 depositions. We said we needed a greater number than that, and then Judge Talwani asked, uh, us to provide just a little summary of the depositions we needed in excess of 15. And, and my memory is she gave us the 28 we were looking for, uh, but also allowed us to do some 30B6 um, depots of some of the vendors that work for Biogen, uh, marketing vendors. And so I think the, the total number of depositions in, in the case 
uh, it exceeded, uh, I'm, I'm not remembering, there was a lot, there was a lot of depositions yeah. in, in the case. Uh, I, I don't want to state the wrong number, but there were a lot. And uh, there were a number of different firms that were defending Biogen over this period of time. Mm -hmm. Ro Ropes and Gray uh, was, pr was present in Carvath and uh, Skadden. And, and I dealt mostly with, at some point Skadden came in and, and uh, worked with Ropes and Gray, but Skadden was, um, main defense counsel and they they were uh, they were very professional in terms of working together and we tried to reduce uh, the number of uh, motions that we brought before the court mm -hmm. and, and resolve things and so we put um, starting at one point when Kravath came in uh, we, we had very few uh, when we needed Judge Tawani's help to resolve something, we went there, but it didn't happen that often. Hmm. So, I just assumed that this case would be tried, and yeah. I wanted to try it. I was excited about it. Um, then in the fall of uh, 2022, mm -hmm. we had a conference with the judge, and she gave us, maybe it's 21, she gave us the trial date uh, for July uh, 2022 um, and we got a call I think it was in December uh, from Cravath that they were not going to move for summary judgment uh, hmm. which was kind of a surprise yeah. in, in a case like this um, and uh, but we had our own affirmative motion for summary judgment we filed uh, and then we went in, in early 2022, from January, you know, probably through May in, into June, there was a lot of uh, motion practice, motion, Daubert motions, mm -hmm. motions in Lemonade, uh, culminating with uh, some decisions by Judge Talwani that were, uh, we, we thought we did, came out very well mm -hmm. with what we we're going to be able to do. Uh, and during this process, uh, Cravath called and asked if we would be interested, uh, asked me if we'd be interested in, in going to mediation. And so we had two tracks going, the mediation track mm -hmm. and the, the trial prep uh, track. And it, it really went right up until into July when we had our third day of mediation. And as I recall, it was a day after a hearing before Judge Talwani, where she disclosed, you know, some of her final rulings that we felt very good about. And mm -hmm. uh, so it was at that, the, the very next day, we were able to settle a case. Uh, was this, uh, I know at some point the Department of Justice filed a statement of interest backing your theory of, you know, the kickback just has to be one of the, the purposes yep. you know, of paying the kickback. Um, how important was that statement of interest? You, know, you always welcome a statement of interest from the government. Yeah. And uh, there, there, was, uh, there was some pretty good law out there in other circuits mm -hmm. uh, that, that followed that, you know, um, if you can show one purpose, um, at, at least at the time, uh, lead, leading up to uh, you know, settlement of our case. So. It, it was helpful to get that get that statement. I, I think in looking back at it, and this is me speculating a little bit on their decision not to file summary judgment, but uh, we had gotten a favorable decision from Judge Delwani on the motion to dismiss. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's pretty clear from the state of the record, uh, yeah. everything that had been developed, that they weren't gonna get out on summary judgment. Yeah. And, but they would risk another opinion uh, now with a factual record there, and I, that's what I think, they just, yeah, uh, they weren't gonna do that. So the uh, allegations are fascinating here. By the way, I enjoyed tracking this on Pacer, uh, all the entries, <laughs> yeah. hundreds and hundreds of entries. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Biogen had three MS drugs. There was a competitor coming on the market provided by, uh, mar marketed by Novartis, and there was this concern uh, and addressed in the complaints that the doctors were going to move over to Novartis' drug and, and uh, Biogen was going to take a big financial hit. And the allegations were, we have to make sure these prescribers 
feel loved. Let's make sure they're, they're on the Speakers Bureau and the consulting programs and, and that they're uh, flying out to California to play golf and maybe get consulted. Um, you said that you were somewhat disappointed that this didn't go to trial. Um, were you ready for trial? You were six days out when this case started. We were ready for trial. Yeah. Um, we had, uh, you know, submitted our jury instructions, uh, uh, Biogen had, we had objections to theirs, um, they had objections to ours, we were designating deposition testimony, um, they listed the witnesses they would uh, produce so that there, there were uh, fewer transcripts that needed designation, uh, you know, jury slip, er, 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 everything was prepared and uh, I fully expected it was going to go to trial. Yeah. Um, I mentioned we had three days of mediation. I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know why we needed three. I thought we could we could try to do it in a phone call, uh, or 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 a mediation. Um, yeah. But they wanted two, so we had two, and we we didn't make that much progress. Um, and then the third mediation session got up uh, set and. Uh, there's, there's a lot of movement there. Mm -hmm. So, was I disappointed? Uh, th there's always risk in, yes. in a jury trial, right. um, no, no matter um, how strong the case is. Uh, and th that's risk for both sides, you mm -hmm. know, for, mm -hmm. for the relator, for the government, uh, and, and for Biogen. Mm -hmm. in, in a case like this, um, our, our damages, uh, singles, uh, as I recall, we're about six hundred million. So, so, so doubled your 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 over over a billion. Um, that was for a six month taint period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had another damage model for a twelve month taint period. So, meaning, yes, the doctor gets paid a kickback. We're going to say that all the scripts for twelve months following the kickback are tainted, mm -hmm. um, and and the. Uh, the the twelve month uh, model, as I recall, was a one point one billion uh, damages. So that doubled or trebled going to trial. Mm -hmm. uh, that's substantial. But on top of that, the statutory penalties because there were yes. a lot of claims. Yeah. So for a publicly traded company um, like Biogen, there's real risk here, mm -hmm. um, and you know there, there is. For the for the relator, I mean, Mike Baduniak uh, uh, made some tough decisions along the way yeah. to keep this case going. Um, he he wanted to, and uh, uh, but nine hundred million dollars is is a lot of money, um, mm -hmm. and when it got to that point, uh, there there's risk. Um, yeah, yeah, and and. I, I thought that was an acceptable number, and I recommended it to Mike. He agreed, and uh, we were able to settle it. So I've gotten to know Mike uh, over the last few months. Uh, we're a remarkable person. Yeah, he, uh, he's a good guy. Yeah, you know, he'd mentioned uh, publicly and to me that you know he hadn't told, did tell his wife for a few years, and didn't tell his sons until really right till the end. So I'm always reminded when I talk to people that you know. Whenever people file these cases and they're under seal, the only people they oftentimes talk to are their lawyers, and you have to play the role of counselor, not just their attorney, but you're counseling them through mm -hmm. this difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that, that role of a key town attorney in counseling their client through the seal period and all the uh, stress of that? And then on top of that, in this case of going to trial and, and Mike's name being out there. Yeah, well, Mike had, um, at some point, um, Maybe it was a couple of years after the case was filed, uh, as I recall, he, he left Biogen and went to work for another pharmaceutical company. Yeah. And when the case came out from under seal, uh, just after it came out, he was confronted by his supervisor uh, at that company mm -hmm. um, who had the case on his laptop and, and turned it around and showed it to Mike and said, what, what's that about? And that was a pretty uncomfortable time for Mike um, of course, he, he, he wasn't terminated, he remained at that company, but he was isolated, and uh, 
he was told that they don't trust him. Uh, and so he saw his opportunity for advancement ended uh, once it became public. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty in these types of cases. Uh, and, and you counsel your clients that uh, you can't guarantee them a result. You can't guarantee them we're going to be successful. Um, it's, it's even difficult to try to put odds on it. Um, but what I did say to Mike and what I say to clients is, is the ultimate decision in a case is the client's decision. Mm. Um, I, I ask that the client listen to advice, but ultimately the client is going to make the decision. Mike was very good uh, all the way along about listening to advice and sticking with the case, uh, especially you know in the last six months when things were really ramping up. Mm. The trial was inevitable. Um, what was our feeling, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and then through the three mediation sessions, which you know spanned about a six-week period, mm -hmm. and you know there's substantial money on the table, um, you know, opening offer and closing offer after first day uh, and second day as well, mm -hmm. but Mike listened to to my advice and. Uh, I just I felt we we could get to a, a much better number, which we ultimately did, um, and and he he was relieved <laughs> the third yeah. day that uh, that the case was re resolved, he, and he could put it behind him, mm -hmm. and there was n no longer any any risk or the the pressure of the case. Um, it, it's been publicly reported that Mike wore a wire for the FBI and uh, had several discussions with people higher up in Biogen and the evidence that was brought to the government. But even then, the government declined. What was Mike's thinking at that point about, I still want to go forward? What, what were some of the thoughts of that? Well, my, Mike thought that, um, with regard to the recordings, that there was some information uh, on those tapes that was supported uh, what he was saying. We thought as well. Um, and, you know, some disappointment uh, initially when the, the government didn't come in. Um, and as we discovered more evidence uh, during the course of discovery with good documents, um, you know, which we would, uh, we would share information with the government. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no secret that you want the government to intervene in a case because then it's the government's resources. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've learned that, that that doesn't always happen and, and maybe only happens in 20% in of cases mm -hmm. or so. So when, when you take these cases, uh, you gotta be committed to seeing it through. Um, you, you can't take a case. I don't believe you should take a case and try to throw something on, against the wall, see if it'll stick, um, see if the government will bite, because you're gonna be disappointed. You're, you're gonna be disappointed most of the time. So, I, and I think our, our bar is very good at this, mm -hmm. vetting the cases, uh, when, when you see problems in the cases, explaining it to the client why you don't think it's viable. Um, sometimes you file a case, you think it's viable, but the government's investigation uh, it reveals something that the government will share with you mm -hmm. about why they don't think it's viable, why they don't want to intervene. And, and when that happens, if they've demonstrated it's not a viable case and you, you agree with it, then uh, our practice is to explain that to the clients because uh, it, it, well, first of all, you don't want to pursue a, a case that's just not going to be successful, yeah. but it's not fair to the, to the relator or the client mm -hmm. to put them through a, a, a decline case if you're, if, you're, if you're pretty certain it's not going to be successful. Um, and, you know, the, the Neurontin case, the Biogen case, um, those were cases that we, we felt very good about, mm -hmm. uh, just based on the initial, um, the initial set of documents the client brought in, in, in each case. And then once you get into discovery, mm -hmm. a lot more good documents. Uh, 
were you surprised the government didn't come in, re-intervene in uh, the Biogen case later after you, know, you uncovered a lot of things during depositions? Did you think they'd come back and intervene at some point? Um, I, I don't think I did. I yeah. mean, you, 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 you keep them informed yeah. uh, as you're required to do, but I, I didn't think they would. You know, the, the, I, I, I mentioned that the government has unlimited resources. Well, <laughs> certainly compared to me, they have unlimited sure. resources. Mm -hmm. But uh, these um, uh, U.S. attorneys' offices and the departments they handle this type of work, the False Claim Act work, uh, they, they are handling a lot of cases, and uh, you know, they, they've selected the cases they want to pursue, but they, they're very busy. Um, and I, I think when, when they don't take a case, uh, and you, you believe in it, just go forward with it. The yeah. good, good things are gonna happen if, if you have the facts. If you have those initial facts that your, your client has, has brought to you, there's going to be more once you get into the documents. There's going to be a lot more, a lot more proof of the, of the wrongdoing. Um, so, it, with regard to Biden, it didn't surprise me, um, and I didn't think. Uh, I mean, once we get our trial date, uh, I, I I knew we were going to be trying the case. That's the way I felt. Uh, I had plans to come up for the opening statement, so I was looking forward to that. <laughs> so 29.63% was the relator share on, on $900 million, the largest whistleblower reward uh, in any program until last week. Uh, SEC paid $274 million last week on a, on, a, on a whistleblower tip from the SEC. 29.63%. Um, I don't know what else you could have done. I think you maybe... You, they, they shortchanged you. Maybe you should have gotten 30, yeah. 30 percent. Um, how was that day? Whenever you found out, you know, this case is settling, the government's going to recognize the time, money, and resources that you and your client put into it and reward you twenty nine point six three percent. The settlement day, uh, when we, after the third day of mediation, we had a term sheet that we signed, and uh, I emailed it to to DOJ. Uh, to the local U.S. Attorney's Office, and then to uh, Colin Huntley, who had been uh, working with me on the case over the years, uh, and there was a lot of satisfaction. I talked to Colin several times that day, uh, yeah. and th there was a lot of sat satisfaction. Then, then of course, you come to relate a share, and now you're, <laughs> you're uh, trying to you're trying to get that thirty percent. But we got pretty close pretty to close. it, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Mike felt pretty good. So Mike said that uh, whistleblowers are an anomaly. That it's, you know, it's rare to be the person who's swimming upstream. And that's so true, right? And you think about Neurotin case, you think about Biogen, think about any of those cases that settle all, yeah. probably off label marketing, massive pharmaceutical manufacturers, and you'll see one, maybe two or three relators step forward out of hundreds of people that recognized it. Why is that? Why are so few people stepping forward in these cases? Um, I think some are, well, some are concerned about their job. Mm -hmm. And they, they, it's a livelihood. They have a family. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're concerned about losing their job. They're concerned about being blackballed by the industry. And um, there's, there's no guarantee. Uh, it's not a sure thing that they're going to have a successful case that's going to end up with a large reward and they're going to get 29.6 percent of it. Yeah. In, in fact, I, I think it was about 266 million dollar uh, reward uh, to David. Uh, you know, as, as you pointed out at the, at the time, um, that was the highest for any single relator mm -hmm. um, in any government program. And I think the largest settlement uh, in any non-intervened case. Right. Uh, and so that's uh, that's pretty w rare in the 150-year history of the statute. Uh, so I, I think a lot of them, and we've had a lot a lot of people that have contacted us, and they they have really good evidence of false claims mm -hmm. in all different types of industry, not just uh, health care. And this is, this is what comes up, that this is a job. I have kids. Yes. Um, 
I, I am on a certain career path, and if we're not successful, um, what am I going to do? And, and for that reason, that's one of the reasons, I think, that um, there aren't more people that come forward. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and if you think of uh, Mike Baduniak for a moment, or e e even David Franklin, David Franklin was almost eight years. You know, mm -hmm. Mike, Mike Baduniak is, you know, 10 years. It's actually more than 10 years, because mm -hmm. it was a while before he agreed to file, file the complaint. Um, and a lot of uncertainty uh, during those time periods for, for each of those clients. Uh, so it's a, it's a rare uh, person that is going to have the courage to come forward. Uh, and in each of those instances, they felt what the companies were doing were, were wrong and it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't continue. And, and, and most re recently, you know, the, the, the Biogen case, Mike tried to fix it internally. Yes. Um, and he was ignored. Um, he, he was ignored because commercial, as I said before, uh, controlled everything. Controlled compliance, controlled legal. Uh, so, but there, there's still people out there that will come forward, e Absolutely. even in the future. And uh, there's a lot of good that's, not, not just the reward, I mean, that's great, but there's a lot of good um, that's accomplished here. And now with regard to Biogen, you know, there, there have been a couple big settlements in the last few years on mm -hmm. kickback cases. Yes. And, uh, and, and there had been prior to this, but Biogen didn't change its conduct, right. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think Novartis settled the year uh, before uh, Biogen for $650 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then Biogen. And so that's a message being yeah. sent to the industry about these tactics, the consultant meetings and, and the Speakers Bureau. I mean, we, when you really think about it, you take some of these companies, if they need to get a consultant's advice, they put it out for bid. Right. And they'll, they'll go to three different vendors and get a price, you know. Um, when, they, when they were holding a, uh, a meeting, you know, at, at a resort for consultants, they, they're negotiating over the price of, of the room and trying to get it down. Um, right, right. But when they uh, retain a vendor to set fair market value, an hourly rate for their consultants, they're, they're, they're trying to get it up as high as they can. So commercial will be happy. Mm. Uh, that's what we saw happening in the Biogen case. So there's a lot of good evidence that you, you, you develop in these cases when, you, when you, you get the evidence from the vendors they're using, the marketing firms they use, and then of course the company's internal documents. So some of the narrative that we've heard from different places, including the Justice Department from time to time, is that declining cases or non-intervening cases that's a lot of time, money, and resources to monitor these cases. But the reality is, you know, when we see things like Biogen case or the Neurotin case that establishes case law that lights a path that then leads to $14 billion recovered, or mm -hmm. in Biogen, you know, lets the world know that kickbacks in pharmaceuticals are still existing and mm -hmm. happening on a large mm -hmm. scale, I think the False Names Act's working, right? It's supplementing the limited resources of the government and establishing good case law. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you have that right. Um, and the government can't take every case. Yeah. Um, and as I've said to you before, there, there are a lot of members of our bar that are very, very good lawyers and know this area and you know, work as, uh, in partnership you know, with DOJ uh, on these declined cases. And so there's that group of, of attorneys that uh, prosecute those cases, and I, when you have a firm that's prosecuting the case that's experienced and they know what they're doing, I'm not sure how much supervision um, is required there. Uh, and as you've just pointed out, when you set a precedent um, in one of these cases, you know, as we have, then look what follows. And 
maybe what follows are, are, are you know, a number of settlements and maybe there are intervened cases, but still if the precedent is set, as, as you say, the, mm -hmm. the engine is, you know, the, the train will follow. Um, so I, I like DOJ's press release in your biogen case. <laughs> um, not often do they single out the whistleblower, but they did here, mm -hmm. and they, they singled out uh, you and stating that we want to thank your relator for uncovering this behavior and bringing it to light. This matter is an important example of the vital role that whistleblowers and their attorneys can play in protecting our nation's public health care programs. And out of Maine justice, they said the relator diligently pursued this matter on behalf of the United States for over seven years. The settlement announced today underscores the critical role that whistleblowers play in complementing the United States' use of the False Claims Act to combat fraud affecting federal health care programs. A recognition of the role that relators play and their attorneys play in moving forward post declination yeah. of these cases. Yeah. So last year was the first year in which non intervening cases, settlement recoveries in non intervening cases outpaced intervening cases. Right. Has our bar matured? Has, is there a, a, a more professional bar on the relator side? Are we doing a better job than we did 30 years ago in bringing these cases? Well, yeah. I remember after um, Rotten settled, uh, Jim Mormon called me uh, and, and came to Boston, and we we had coffee. And I didn't know that much. At some point, I got introduced to, to uh, Taxpayers Against Fraud. But if I think of the early days, um, you know, let's say, when I say early days, not the early 90s when mm -hmm. I started doing this work, but when I became involved, mm -hmm. I'd say from that, that point of time, just say around 2004, mm -hmm. you know, up to this, uh, this period of time, you know, 19 years, I've seen, uh, I think, maturity uh, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in different firms around the country. There, there's, there's a lot more uh, yeah. firms uh, and there, there, as I said, there are a lot of good firms that do good work mm -hmm. and that pair up with, with other firms and co-prosecute cases. Uh, you know, if you have a, de a decline case, um, there, they can be a lot of effort. And if, yeah. it's, if, it's, if it's a case like Franklin or like Biogen, you know, you, you really need a team uh, of lawyers now. Maybe, maybe you have them internally, but uh, uh, there's there are a lot of good guys uh, around the country. Good good lawyers around the country that um, can handle it, these cases. So I'm, I'm thinking about the future of our practice area and, and your sons and your firm. Now yeah. the legacy continues. Yeah. Um, where are we headed? Um, anywhere and everywhere the government spends money, yeah. uh, you know, for the, for the false claim act case. Of course, now we have IRS whistleblower, we have SEC whistleblower, we have, uh, you're gonna have to help me with it, but. CTF, uh, CFTC, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, right. Well, I was gonna say TAF, uh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the new, uh, uh -huh. uh, so I, you know, anywhere the government spends money, yes. uh, there's the potential for fraud. Uh, there, there are some cases we have under seal that have some interesting yeah. theories. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, I just think it's, a, you know, 1986 when they strengthened the, uh, the, the statute um, mm -hmm. and, and making tweaks along the way to the correct certain court decisions has, has just made made the the remedies here uh, and the incentives here strong, stronger. Uh, so I, I think uh, I, I don't think there's ever going to be an end to fraud. Mm. Uh, I think some of the practices, off-label marketing, maybe kickbacks, pharma kickbacks, uh, some of that will will change, but. Mm. Um, talking about the healthcare industry for a moment, their, their customers are the, the, you know, the hospitals, uh, 
the doctors. Um, and so the government health care programs are going to be involved. And if, if you're trying to develop business, let's say in, in non-healthcare programs, well, you, you take people out and you wind them and dine them mm -hmm. or uh, you, know, you shower them with, with, with tickets. So that you can't do that when you're dealing with health care and mm -hmm. it involves government uh, health care programs. So uh, I, I still think in the, in the health care industry field, that, um, and we've seen this with device um, cases, there, there's fraud. Um, and, and there, there are kickbacks, uh, and, there's, and they're, they're still going on. Um, and there, there, there are whole other different industries too, where there, there are, where the money, where the, the government spends money. There, there is fraud. Uh, there are people that are trying to maximize their profits by not following um, rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in many industries because it's expensive to do so. It cuts into the bottom line. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, so Tom, you're, uh, you're joining our senior leadership on the President's Council. Oh. <laughs> uh, you made a generous donation to our organization uh, of a million dollars to make, make sure this organization continues going forward. There's some potential whistleblower out there right now watching this program. They're probably where Mike was in 2010, 2011, 2012. And they're thinking about, you know, is this the right path for me? Um, what do you say to that person? Well, I, I say, obviously, it's a personal decision. Mm -hmm. And you've got to weigh the uh, pros and cons and you've got to seek some advice or some counsel about what those pros and cons are. Mm. Uh, you, you have some idea of them, but you, you don't know of the, the pitfalls along the way during the course of the litigation, or on the other hand, the, the, the way things, facts might break uh, in, in your favor. So I, I think you have to consider your, your family. You have to consider your career. Yeah. You, you have to think about these things, and only you can make that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say, uh, can you correct it internally? Mm -hmm. um, and I've had that discussion with clients. Uh, sometimes they have been able to yeah. correct things internally. The company actually listens and stops the practice. Right. Uh, other times the company retaliates. Um, and mm -hmm. if it's just such a profitable practice, um, the, the uh, temptation is not, not to end the practice, but to keep the gravy train running. Mm. Uh, so. But that, that's, a, that's a decision that each relator has to make. And as, as you pointed out, an anomaly, you said, uh, a whistleblower is an anomaly. Um, some of them just know the conduct is wrong. And if not me, who mm. is going to turn this around? You know, especially if they've tried to correct the situation internally and they're being ignored. Uh, I think of, uh, you know, with. I always tell people that we work with these should have been employees of the month. You think of Mike going to compliance and being like, look, I, what we're doing yeah. here is wrong. And, yeah. and, and, you know, instead of listening, they do other things. Uh, so I, I think, you know, these are, these should have been employees of the month. Mike definitely should yeah. have been the employee of the month. Yeah. Right? You know, um, there, there's a, a culture at the, these companies that they, they think and they say, and we've heard it through clients, that their competitors are engaged in, uh, yes. in, in the, these practices, you know. Let's say consultant meetings or speaker bureau. I mean, we, we have had evidence that the physicians are saying to the sales rep that your competitor, drug company yeah, B, yes. As this is what they paid me uh, in this past year in, in consultant fees, you know. 
Uh, I'm even allowed to invite uh, a nurse from my office to get a consultant fee at, at a meeting. And so the companies feel that they have to keep up with their competitors. Uh, and perhaps uh, with cases like Novartis, like Biogen, maybe it's going to take another few, uh, a few hits, major hits. and. Th this practice of paying consultants when you don't need them, mm -hmm. you don't collect the advice, you don't use the advice, um, maybe these practices will stop. Um, I've always thought, you know, it's the, the kickback tango, it takes two to, to tango, and if, if the Justice Department took a more aggressive stance going after prescribers who are re receiving the blatant kickbacks and publicize how they're taking an active stance, uh, you know, in Biogen, there's none of the doctors ended up, as far as I know, definitely didn't serve prison time or settle false claim back cases, that that might be one way to reduce these blatant kickbacks, right? Yeah, you, you make a good point there. Um, and I, I, I agree with that. You, you don't see it very often. Um, so it's the doctors, uh, if, if the government targeted them, and they've done this sometimes in, yeah. in, in lab testing, urine lab testing. I had a case where they they went after some of the doctors, went well, after the lab te testing company, but some of the doctors. Mm -hmm. But similarly, if DOJ went after some of the higher level company employees, um, I think that would set an example. And if the conduct is bad enough and criminal, mm -hmm. and they went after them criminally, that might uh, really uh, cause a change um, here. Because if you thought you could be indicted, um, I, I think you'd, you might feel very differently uh, about running some of these programs or being so aggressive or crossing the line. Uh, and I, I, the, I think the Department of Justice has probably done that in, in a couple of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they did a little bit more of it, that would send a strong message, um, I think. And you, you, you might stop a lot of this bad conduct. So Tom, earlier uh, we started off talking about how just a couple years out of the DA's office or uh, with the DA's office you hang a shingle in Boston <laughs> yeah. as a plaintiff's lawyer. Yeah. Um, that kind of, I don't know if it's entrepreneurial spirit or just like, you know, I'm just going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to bank on myself and say that, you know, I can move forward and be successful in this practice. It seems to be a thread through your whole career, you know, when I think about moving forward without the government against some of the largest pharmaceutical giants in the world, what drives you? Well, if you talk about the plaintiff cases, which, you know, is how, how I started off, um, I, I would say I, I wanted to fight for the little guy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I liked Robin Hood, you know, I, yeah, I liked, that, that type of story. I, I did not want to be representing a company. Um, and so when I started off, uh, that's what I did. My, my practice was representing plaintiffs, not, not hourly work. And uh, I got a lot of satisfaction uh, in, in helping individuals and families. And uh, uh, that I never had problems sleeping at night. I, I felt good. I mean, th there was a lot of pressure. Uh, there was a lot of risk, but uh, maybe it's my competitive spirit uh, that I, I, I liked the challenge. Um, and then the False Claim Act cases came along. Uh, and I, I, I had no fear and have no fear about going into a courtroom. I feel very comfortable there. It's, it's what I enjoy. And so there's not that type of pressure on me. The, it, it's an enjoyment to try a case, especially a big case. Um, and, you know, if you take one of these cases, and as I said before, I hope the government will intervene or you're not committed to see it through. Yeah. 
or you think you're only going to see it through and you hope that they're going to offer some money and there'll be some type of settlement. That's a disservice to your client, but you're, you're never going to get the, the result the case may um, deserve. Mm -hmm. And you, you got to take the case and be prepared for declination and be excited about the challenge mm -hmm. uh, in the development of the case, in the discovery of the facts, uh, the team of experts, you know, all the pretrial work. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you enjoy that, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work, you know, I think, uh, you know, we put in over 30,000 hours uh, on the Biogen case, and uh, I think it was about 2.3 million uh, in out-of-pocket expenses. But um, I, I didn't feel any pressure because of the time or because of the out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, I was committed to the case, and I, I did think we were going to be successful. I, I thought uh, I thought it was going to be a jury verdict. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's the the work is interesting. I like the challenge. It's it's a contest, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, I'm competitive. I, I don't want to lose. I I I don't have all the answers by far, but there are experts out there that can help educate you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get a good team of um, attorneys together that are, are enjoy the challenge, um, then you're in good, good, good shape. So I talked to a lot of people, told them that I'm coming up here to interview you. Uh, a lot of our young lawyers uh, had many suggestions for things I should ask. Um, what do you? What are your recommendations to new lawyers that are getting involved in this? I know your sons in your your firm. Uh, there's other. Uh, our young lawyers division now makes up a quarter of our membership. Oh, is that uh, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's a growing area. Yeah. What do you say to those people? There's no easy way, um, and there's there's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You shouldn't look at it that way. I, I would take take on each client, each client's case, and do the absolute best job you you can in that case. You've got to do all the legal research. If you need experts, you got to get all the right experts. The young lawyers, I did this. You you should be talking to more experienced lawyers to bounce ideas off them or get some advice. And um, I, I think really legal research is is so important. Making sure that you 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 know the law in in the in the areas um, that are applicable to the case. Um, you, you really can leave no stone uh, unturned. That, that was my approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, you wanted to be fully prepared for whatever would be thrown at you. Now, maybe you're not always, maybe something surprises you, mm -hmm. but you, you gotta use your best efforts to get, get prepared. Um, and I, I am not a procrastinator. Um, and I don't, I don't want to leave things to the end. Yes. So you, you got to plan your case. You got to start working on your opening and closing. Um, I had mine done in the Biogen case. Yeah. Uh, you, you got to be ready to go because you, you can't wait till the 11th hour. Um, that's too much pressure and uh, you, you don't need that. So that's some advice to the young lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would just say always, uh, you know, um, abide by the ethics, uh, abide by, follow the rules, uh, make sure you're educated on, on the rules, local rules um, included, and uh, you, you'll, you'll be successful. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it, it's one case at a time, it's one year at a time. Um, and don't, don't let the pot of gold be your motivation. Um, that may come, but ha have the client's case be your motivation to get the best result you can for that client. And remember, it's the client's decision on whether to settle a case. It, it's, your, it's your responsibility to prepare that case, to advise the client, but never let your financial interest mm -hmm. affect the advice you're going to give your client. Um, 
you don't want to ever get yourself in a position where you've expended too much on your case expenses or on your overhead and you're letting that impact mm -hmm. your decision on whether to settle a case. And, and I've seen that mm -hmm. um, happen uh, in, in, in some cases and uh, uh, never, never get yourself in that position. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think you, you, you can in, enjoy your practice, work hard, and get a lot of satisfaction yeah. uh, out of it. And, and you, you will be successful, but it's a lot of hard work. Well, Tom, I just want to acknowledge you. Uh, thank you for welcoming me into your, uh, your beautiful home, but I want to acknowledge you for lighting a path for so many others. Um, oh, thank you, Jim. Both in the government and outside of the government. Uh, I really appreciate the time we spent today. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So until next episode of Fraud in America, if you see something, say something. And if that doesn't work, make sure you do something. If you believe you have witnessed fraud against the government or fraud on the financial markets, we encourage you to visit our website at taf.org, where you will find a directory of member attorneys who represent whistleblowers across the country. On our website, you will also find additional information about our nation's various whistleblower laws and programs and a way to donate to our organization as we step forward in spreading information about whistleblower programs. This episode was edited and produced by Rachel Brooks and our theme song is by Connor Chaos. A big thank you to our TAF staff and researchers of James King, Emma Bass, Jackie DeMar, Kate Scanlon, Max Boldman. Fraud in America is a project of Taxpayers Against Fraud Education Fund. The opinions expressed on today's show belong solely to the guest and are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Fraud in America.